Hello. Our story continues inside the Jedi Temple. Two individuals were dueling with each other. Their blades clashed against their opponents. The two of them stepped around in a circle. They were located in one of the various training halls inside the temple. The taller one held his lightsaber out in front of him, using Form 4 as a smaller one put their blade behind them and swung forward aggressively. The smaller one pushed the larger one backwards, and then the larger one using their size to their advantage spun away. The smaller Jedi flew to the ground as the larger one removed his mask. Edis smiled. He aged 10 years, and he stepped over to his little sister and reached his hand out towards her. Luna removed her mask and looked up at her older brother. She nodded her head and reached up for his hand. Titus pulled his little sister up and told her she was doing well. She just needed to be a little bit more patient with her moves. Luna admitted that she thought she had him that time. Titus put his hand on his sister's shoulders and told her that she was right there. When she completed her Padawan trials, her master would be very fortunate to have a student like her. Luna nodded her head. She was always the quiet type, but she also didn't have much to say. Luna held a lot on her shoulders. She wanted to be the best Jedi she could be, though she was a bit disjointed from the ways of the Jedi Order and the ways of the Code itself. Her older brother, on the other hand, closely tied himself to the Jedi Order and the Code. He believed that as a Jedi, it was his responsibility to follow the code. He didn't force that onto his sister, but he did take every feasible moment there was as an opportunity to remind his sister about the code and to follow it. It was kind of annoying, though it wasn't easy for the two of them being so far apart in age. Titus was 22 and Luna was 13. The year was 22 BBY. Titus was still a Padawan learner, working closely with his master Usk. Master Usk allowed his student to work with his little sister because he believed it would be better for the Order if they worked together. Titus grew up incredibly well, especially with a powerful master like Usk. Being a Trandoshan Jedi Master was an incredible feat, and it was incredibly rare to see. In which case, Usk was very familiar with Luna, but he never really interacted with her. To Usk, it was very important for Titus to be a part of Luna's life, but it was always rough around the edges. Titus and Luna got along no problem, but the disconnect was elsewhere. It wasn't explicitly because of the time that Luna and Titus were brought to the temple, considering it was only a year difference in age, Titus being brought here when he was two and Luna when she was three, though Luna had a lot closer of a connection to her mother and father than Titus did. It was a bit difficult for her to let go of her lineage, which every Jedi had memories of their original families in forms of images, still motion pictures inside their minds. Luna's memories were animated though. She could hear voices, see movements, watch eyes blink. It was a lot more personal for Luna than it was her brother. The first time Luna admitted she sort of missed her family, Titus told her that it was time for her to let them go. Luna was only five years old when that happened, and Titus was 14. He had been a Padawan for a good while, and he was starting to get a little pushy against the idea of keeping those attachments. This left a sour taste in Luna's mouth, and she couldn't really ever forget about it, because Titus wasn't quiet about it, which ended up exposing her missing her family to the instructors of the younglings. The teachers inside the temple weren't the worst, and yet they weren't the best. Their job entailed them ensuring that children moved on from their familial connections and severing any of those attachments aside from their connection to the Force itself. It was rather basic, but after some time, the behavior could get a bit more vile. Considering most children were able to sever their bond with their families when they were about four years old, these instructors went extra hard on the student that couldn't. So for a five, six, and sometimes seven year old who held on to those connections, they faced extreme difficulties because these instructors forced that bond out of the children. It was the way of the Jedi, and while the beautiful temple looked gorgeous, just from the exterior, on the interior it could be dark and tampered by the behavior of those influenced by the code. Of course Luna was unfortunate of joining the temple after Anakin Skywalker became a part of the temple, and he gave these instructors a lot of problems, so it's very plausible to assume that these teachers were hard on Luna because they were taking their anger out on her. Very not the Jedi way, but according to rumors, Anakin was a pain for the instructors to deal with. Though no one really knew, most of the stories of the prophesied chosen one were just stories students told to each other. Luna still being being so young heard all those stories, though most of them were simply just not true. It was kids being kids, and that's all they knew. To them, Anakin was an alien, having so much power, so little control, and a vast array of emotions. Luna actually was really inspired by Anakin Skywalker. Many of the other younglings saw Anakin Skywalker as disingenuous in his care towards the Jedi Code itself. They believed he was a pompous boy who had everything gifted to him on a silver platter. It went along with the treatment young Skywalker faced as a youngling before he became Kenobi's Padawan. Though Anakin, wasn't seen as a hero. 
Shadow. So there was no reason for younglings, padawans, or anyone else to look up to him. He was a black sheep of the order, being one of the only Jedi to wear unorthodox clothing. There was another one, but many of these younglings didn't know his name. It was like Quinlan or Qui-Gon Voss or something like that. Luna's class would talk ill about Skywalker all the time when they had free time. Again, just passing rumors around. One girl heard that he forced choked a pirate on a mission with Obi-Wan, which led to a bunch of people being killed. Another student heard that he tried to kill Obi-Wan in a sparring match. Luna, while being a bit disconnected from her peers, would talk to her older brother about Skywalker for his opinions on him. Titus had only interacted with Skywalker once or twice, but they were relatively normal conversations. He didn't believe there was anything really wrong with Anakin. Especially because if he was just different, it didn't make him weird, it just made him him. Titus respected Anakin, even though Anakin was three years younger than him, though Titus typically avoided sparring with the Chosen One. He was a scary opponent, and Titus made that very clear to Luna. When Anakin was 13 and Titus was just 15 years old, they sparred, and because Anakin didn't have full control of his emotions, he nearly cut off Titus's arm. Anakin had apologized after the spar, and while Titus was forgiving, he wanted absolutely nothing to do with sparring Skywalker. While the age difference was manageable for the two of them, Luna loved the stories her brother shared with her. Titus was a 22-year-old Padawan, but he had gone on many adventures with Master Usk. Usk and Titus specialized in Jedi pirating. This wasn't a typical thing for a Jedi to do, but Usk and Titus were some of the best at it. Jedi pirating entailed the two of them acting like pirates, scoundrels, or smugglers to get into crime rings and shut them down. They were one of the better duos in the Order at accomplishing these missions, and it worked really well, especially with Usk being a Trandoshan. The two of them broke down half of the course on Underworld Crime Ring on level 1313. It was a huge project and it took nearly two years to complete. That was a very troublesome one for Titus. These missions typically lasted for long periods of time. When he wasn't on these missions, he spent time exclusively inside the temple itself, many times with his sister. Titus could tell that there was a disconnect between the two of them, and so he tried his best to bridge that gap with his sister. Sometimes, he brought back little trinkets from across the galaxy for his sister. He wasn't really supposed to do that, but Master Usk didn't really care. Luna had a little collection of trinkets in her room, but the main prize were her stories that her brother told to her. She knew that from these stories she could learn anything she wanted to learn about. Stories were the key to the galaxy and to the universe. If she learned as much as she could as a young girl, then surely she would be a great Padawan, which was right around the corner for her. Regardless, after their training session, Titus and Luna split up. Titus was getting ready for a mission with his master, and there was a ring of pirates on the Outer Rim planet of Florum where Hondo Anaka was based. Usk and Titus were being sent out there to take out his hideout and get Hondo into jail. Master Usk was hesitant about going to Florum, as he told a student that about 200 Jedi had just departed the Jedi Temple. Master Usk had never seen so many Jedi depart the temple at the same time, so he couldn't really figure out what was going on and why. There was no word about it, all he saw was an army of Jedi walk through the temple halls together. So many notable faces. Though Master Usk told his student that it was awfully peculiar, most of the present Jedi Council members, aside from even Peel, Opo Rancis, and a few others, went. Usk told Titus that he saw a ton of the Jedi heading towards a hangar. Titus told his master that while he and Luna were in the training session, Master Plo came into the room, whispered into the ears of a couple of the Jedi Masters who were watching, before they all excused themselves from watching. Titus asked what he thought was going on. Usk told a student that he wasn't entirely sure. He ran through a hundred scenarios and there was no reasonable conclusion. Master Usk and Titus were walking through the hallways and they ran into Master Syndralic, who was being escorted by a number of temple guards. Master Usk stopped the Jedi Battle Master and asked what was going on. Syndralic stopped and told the temple guards to finish preparations. Syndralic turned and told Master Usk that the entire temple was being shut down. No one would be allowed to leave or enter. All Jedi across the galaxy were being restricted to travel. Master Usk asked why and what was happening. Syndralic told Usk that he was unable to relay those orders. There was to be no communication leaving the temple either. Usk nodded his head and then asked who these orders were given by. Master Syndralic looked at Usk and then to Titus telling him that it was under direct orders of the High Council, the Master of the Order, and the Grand Master themselves. Syndralic bowed to the two of them before carrying on. Titus looked worriedly at his master as Usk told his apprentice that they would not be going to Florum. In the meantime, they would just remain patient. There had to be a good reason for all this urgency. Titus couldn't wrap his mind around it. The two started down the hallway. Typically, temple guards were invisible. They were always around in full force, but they were like ghosts. You never really notice them if you walk past them, but right now they could very easily be seen 
anywhere in the temple. Something was wrong. Usk told Titus that he should go to the archives for the time being and see if he could get his sister and keep her distracted. It was the free period at the moment where all the younglings could do what they wanted before their evening classes. Titus found his sister sitting in the Jedi Temple Garden. He walked up and sat down next to her. She was sitting on the steps in front of the tree, just looking at it. Titus asked if she was alright. She just looked over at him and nodded her head. She didn't have anything to say as she closed her eyes again. A gust of breeze crested over the walls and blew through her hair, Luna felt into the force. Titus asked her if she would like to head to the archives. She opened her eyes again and nodded her head. As Titus stood up and reached down to help her up, she grabbed his hand and he pulled her up. They started walking as Titus started to explain everything going on, about the hundreds of Jedi leaving the temple, the temple being shut down, Master Syndralic and the whole thing. Titus opened the door and noticed his sister wasn't next to him. He looked over and ran to her side. She was on her knees holding her chest. Titus asked what was wrong. She looked up at him and a tear slid down her face. She told him that there was so much death, so much pain, something terrible had happened and she didn't know what it was. Titus tried to figure out what it was that she lashed onto, but she didn't have the words. All she was feeling is what of the force was putting out to the galaxy for her to feel. It was terrible. Titus picked up on it a little bit, but not nearly as much as Luna did. Titus put his arms around his sister and helped her to her feet. He told her that they should go inside, suggesting that she take her mind off of it. Luna shoved him away, looking at him as another tear slid down her face. She told him that this wasn't something they could just take their mind off of. It was a massacre. Something terrible had begun. For the two of them, there was nothing to lead them to know that anything terrible was going on. Titus didn't keep up with the politics of the Galactic Senate, and younglings were encouraged to avoid looking at it. The only thing in the Senate that was so large was a military creation bill. This bill gave Palpatine the power to create a Grand Army of the Republic, which by happenstance had already been built. Luna looked at her brother with a glare, as she asked him how he could just ignore this great pain. How could he just be looking to look away? Titus shook his head. He told her that he wasn't looking away, but accepting that in this moment there was nothing he could do about it. When he had the opportunity to do something, he would. Her face turned red. She told him that he was a Jedi, and if Jedi were meant to do the right thing, then why wasn't he? Titus didn't know where to go with this. Sure, he could feel it, but Sinjalik instructed him, telling him that no Jedi were permitted to leave the temple. Luna looked away from her brother. She then told him that she wanted to be alone in the garden. Titus told her that he could be here if she wanted him to be, but she shook her head as she turned away from him. Titus creased his eyebrows as he turned around and stormed away from his little sister. He was actually really annoyed with this behavior. It was kind of inexcusable behavior coming from a Jedi. She should be better. A billion thoughts ran through his mind as he began shattering her argument, telling himself that Luna was in the wrong, that the Jedi could make mistakes, but this one wasn't on them. He kept going on and on, making his way back to his room. In the next 12 hours, everything would change. The entire galaxy would be upended, and the Jedi were being thrust into the Clone Wars. The Battle of Genosis was hidden from the rest of the Jedi Order, because Mace Windu and Master Yoda believed that they would be able to win at the battle and put the Separatists away. Their intention was to end the war before it could ever begin, but the CIS was much more prepared than they initially thought. With Palpatine's military creation bill, the clone army was moved back to Coruscant so that they could be dispatched into the galaxy. And instead of sitting on neutral ground, the Jedi would join the war on behalf of the Republic. The Jedi would become generals in the Clone Wars. The news would be revealed to the Jedi inside of the temple. Luna was heartbroken. She couldn't believe the Jedi would just join the war on behalf of the Republic, let alone participate in such a war. This was even more disappointing for Luna because she was a youngling about to become a Padawan. If her master was a part of the war effort, then she would be forced to fight in a war she did not believe in. Titus, on the other hand, would join his master's new legion. The Trandoshan Jedi Master and his apprentice would become a part of the 73rd Legion and would begin leading the legion in a war effort. Titus was tough on the outside, but being a part of the war wasn't something he'd ever think he'd be a part of. Luna knew that Titus had no say in the matter, considering he was still a Padawan, but she told him that she was disappointed that Titus was invested in fighting in the war on behalf of the Jedi and the Republic. The way he explained it was like how the Jedi of the Old Republic stood up to the forces of evil in the galaxy, but Luna admitted that this wasn't a fight against the Sith. It was a fight against a group of political activists that disagreed with the Republic, and if you try to look deeper into the surface level conflict, it was Dooku renouncing the ways of the Republic Republic for what he believed was better. Of course, the only reason Luna knew this was because shortly after the Battle of Genosis, the Republic reported the battle in every news outlet on Coruscant. It wasn't very difficult to find information regarding the fall of Master Dooku, or should it be his ascension to his family's wealth on Sereno. Luna read it all, and she was very invested in learning, and she admitted that her brother was betraying the way of the Jedi for the purpose of this war. Titus told Luna that he believed they were doing what was right for the galaxy. The last thing Luna told Titus before he was whisked away towards the war was that Titus was only doing what he thought was right for the Republic, because not the entire galaxy stood 
with the Republic. This sat on Titus's mind a lot. He was very disappointed in what his sister said to him, and it truthfully ate away at him. Master Usk, Titus, and the 73rd wouldn't see any active combat. They'd be stationed on a fleet in the core, just awaiting deployment into the next sector battle. That's all there was to it. What would become of them was a waiting on a move made by the Separatists. Of course, after Genosis, the war began, with the CIS reaching its evil hands out into the galaxy and jumping down the throats of innocent planets to inform them that they were in control. Anyone who didn't agree would suffer, which rarely in the Outer Rim meant that individuals would actually suffer, considering most of the planets didn't see eye to eye with the Republic anyways. Titus and Usk were on the bridge talking about everything that Luna said to him. Usk told his student that his sister was very strong-willed. There was nothing wrong with that. There was also nothing wrong with her beliefs. There are many Jedi who felt the same about it. Though Usk informed a student that she had to be her very own individual. She could be influenced by others, especially her soon-to-be master, whoever that may become. But she had a decision to make for herself, and they were her decisions. If she didn't, then she would just be nothing but a mindless droid, like the ones the clones and the Jedi were fighting. A message came in from the Republic High Command. The captain of the ship took in the order and told General Usk and Commander Titus that they were being dispatched to Sulukamai. The Jedi General told the captain to jump to light speed. This would be their very first confrontation during the weak old conflict. Inside of the Jedi Temple, Luna and a handful of other students were going through the Padawan selection process. Luna had already finished her trials and she was watching as some of her classmates went through the Padawan trials. Currently, youngling Caleb Doom was doing his trials. Luna sat there and watched along with several other Jedi as Caleb did his thing. Luna actually liked Caleb the most out of all of her peers. He was one of the most down-to-earth classmates and to Luna he was kind of cute in a quirky, goofy way. Though to be honest, she was really tired of waiting through this. She was nervous about what her future master would do with her. Luna really didn't want to get involved in the war, but that wouldn't be her choice. When Caleb was done, he came back and sat down in his seat next to Luna, as they waited for the masters to be selected. The first one got up, and it was Grandmaster Yoda. He selected Ahsoka Tano. This was really weird considering most Jedi knew that Dooku was his last student, and especially after Dooku abandoned the Order becoming one of the Lost Twenty, it was weird to see Yoda pick a student. Ahsoka got up and walked over to Yoda, and the two of them started for the door. Next was Caleb. He got picked by Jedi Master Depa Balaba, another council member. Luna found it peculiar that council members were taking in new students, just as the war was beginning. Luna waited until she saw a familiar face, though the face wore wrinkles. Luna wasn't entirely sure who it was until Master Jarek Kron called her name and asked her to join her. Master Kron was originally going to take Titus, but Usk told her that he really wanted to take him, so Jara allowed him to do so. She was really interested in training one of the children from Earth, and while it was disappointing for so many years that she couldn't be a part of the training process for Titus, she was happy to see the Jedi and the man that he became. He was going to be a fine Jedi Knight, and even more so, a Jedi Master. The future despite the war was bright for Titus. As for Luna, Master Kron believed her little student would follow in the same footsteps. Because after all, Jaren knew there was a lot more potential with midichlorians in concern to Luna. She may have had more midichlorians than her older brother, even more so than some of the masters on the High Council, but she didn't refine her talents. Whereas Titus and Jedi Master Kenobi, for example, refined their abilities, worked hard at their craft, and were dedicated to getting better every day, they became some of the better Jedi in the Order because they worked hard. Luna, on the other hand, hadn't refined her abilities. The Force didn't play favorites, and some were just fortunate to have a higher midichlorian count, but it was a matter of what one did with them. Master Kron liked how Kenobi taught Skywalker, because someone as powerful as Anakin needed a lot of refining, which was hard to do for an inexperienced master. Something Jara always thought was awry was how the Jedi had Kenobi teach Skywalker, and never made any sense, but Obi-Wan was widely respected for teaching Anakin, because a lot of the Jedi saw how much of a hard time his student gave him. Though Jara was very unaware of the circumstances that led Kenobi to taking Skywalker in as an apprentice, something the Jedi Master never really talked about. He never really thought it was anything to talk about anyways with any other Jedi. It was a promise to Qui-Gon and it was no one else's responsibility or need to know information. Jara took her young student and told Luna that they would be heading towards the hangar bay. Luna's heart sank into her stomach as she asked if they were going to be joining the war effort. Jara shook her head. They were being sent to an outpost in the Mid-Rim. Their responsibility was to look after an ancient ruin of a Jedi temple on Dantooine. Though Jara said that they wouldn't be going here for an extended period of time. The only reason is that they were going here was because the Jedi needed to move all their artifacts back to the temple. Jara told her apprentice that they would go where the Order needed them to go. Jara then told her student that she informed the Council that she would serve if and when they needed to do so. 
Luna hid away a frown from her master. She was very disappointed. She wanted to be away from the war effort so badly, and now she had no choice. Luna believed the Jedi way was to avoid such conflicts, but apparently not. In the Messina system, a ship landed down in one of the major capitals on the planet, the first ship landing in Rome itself. Out of the vessel came a tactical droid, along with a number of B-1 battle droids. These droids came here to see if Earth would join the CIS in their effort to destroy the Republic. The irony of the situation is that most of the Republic didn't know that Earth existed, aside from the few of the Jedi who had been to Earth. No one knew about the planet. When Dooku erased Kamino from the Jedi archives, he erased a number of systems, including Kaminoan former colony, Boravio, and the Messina system. Dooku knew he could take advantage of the primitive system that hadn't interacted with any of the galaxy. His initial decision to include them in the CIS was simply to use them as a support system for the Separatists. Of course, the Messina system couldn't feasibly do anything in this galactic war, but Dooku had secret plans, ones that he intended on keeping secret from his master. Of course, they did slightly rely on cooperation from the people of this planet. The tactical droid would end up going from major civilization to major civilization across the planet of Earth, giving each civilization 10 days to give him an answer. If they didn't want to join the Separatists, then they would leave the planet of Earth peacefully and wish them good luck that the Republic and their clone troopers wouldn't rain hell down onto the planet of Earth. Of course, the tactical droid projecting the Republic as the war criminals and the ones who created the conflict of the Clone Wars. Outside the planet, a small Separatist fleet was stationed, awaiting the response from the people of Earth. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is part three of our mini-series. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, Mad Men Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. As you guys already know, the story's already been finished, but it's kind of built like a movie, so the conflict's gonna start coming soon. Anyways, I can't wait for you guys to see what comes next. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.